Welcome to our Cornerstone Connection lesson. Um, on the set today, we have Peter, Sid, Salmon, Ashley, and Teacher Kelvin. On our instruments, we have Subira and Mpisi, and Joyce will be doing sign language. Before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. Oh God, we come before you this morning to thank you for everything that you've done for us thus far. As we're about to start, be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. When Amira turned six, his father began to look for a good school for his daughter in India. He didn't want Amira to go to just any school. He wanted the little girl to go to the best school. But where could he find such a school to start a first grade? The question bothered father as he ate breakfast. The question bothered father as he went to work. It bothered him as he got his hair cut after work. What is a good school where I can send my god daughter? He asked his barber. Sent her to the Seventh-day Adventist school. The barber said, it is a good school. The father never heard of the Seventh-day Adventists. He was not a Christian. He had been raised in another world region. But he was impressed that the barber had recommended the Adventist school. He sent Amira to study at the Adventist school. <coughs> Amira loved the school. She came home after school every day talking about Jesus. She sang joyful Christian songs that she had learned. She told father, about the stories that she had heard from the Bible, she showed Father how she was learning how to pray. Father liked to hear about what Amira was learning at school, but what amazed him most was Amira's smiles. He had never seen her so happy before. She had started going to the school. She had always looked sad, but now she was smiling as brightly as the sun. Father was delighted that his little girl was so happy. He wished he could be as happy as her, but he couldn't because he didn't feel well. His stomach often hurt, and the pain made him feel very sad. Amira noticed that his father wasn't smiling like her. She wanted him to be happy. Even though she was only six, she had an idea. Come to the school, she said. Someone will pray for you. So the next time, father took Amira to school. He followed her inside. Would someone pray for him? Near Amira's class classroom, father saw the school accountant. The accountant helped count the school's money. Will you pray for me? The father asked. The accountant gladly prayed for, uh, for father. He asked God to give father good health and happiness. After the prayer, the accountant told the school pastor about father. The school pastor contacted father and asked if he would like to study the Bible. Father agreed, and he and the pastor began to meet to study the Bible. Father was amazed as he learned about Jesus. Amira had told him some things about Jesus, but now he was reading the things that he had never known. Did you know all this all your life? He asked the pastor. I wish that I had known this many years ago. Father began to grow happier and happier. He smiled more and more. He and Amira read the Bible together. There were two they too went to church on Sabbath together. Soon, he and Amira were perhaps the happiest father and daughter in India. But mother wasn't happy. She didn't know Jesus and she didn't want to know Jesus. She belonged to another world religion. And she didn't want father and Amira reading the Bible or going to church on Sabbath. Stop going to church, she told father. Stop reading the Bible. Father didn't know what to do. As mother complained, father's stomach pain grew worse. Adventist friend took him to hospital and cared for him there. The doctor said that father needed an operation. Something amazing happened as father waited for, for the operation. As he lay in bed, he had a dream that he saw Jesus. Father had never seen such a kind face. It was so beautiful. One look at his face filled father with peace and calmness. Do not be afraid, Jesus said. I am with you. In the dream, father also saw the pastor. He understood that the pastor was a good man who was bringing him closer to Jesus. After the operation, father had another dream. This dream, he saw Jesus smiling, reassuring at him. After that, Father had no more doubt about what to do. He wanted to give his heart to Jesus. When mother heard the news, she became very angry. She was so angry that she went to another room to sleep at night. Alone in bed, father couldn't fall asleep. He wondered if he had made the right decision in giving his heart to Jesus. Then he felt like Jesus came into the room. He didn't see Jesus, but it was like Jesus came in and touched him on the shoulder. He felt complete peace. The father decided to follow Jesus no matter what. When mother saw that father had made up his mind to follow Jesus, she began to calm down. She remembered the Adventists that helped care for father in the hospital, and she decided that they must be good people. When the Adventist church offered some free medical care, she went with father to the church for the first time. Mother was impressed with the people that she saw in the church. She saw that they were kind and loving. She stopped being angry with father and Amira. Today, father is praying for mother to accept Jesus. Amira is praying for mother to accept Jesus. They want mother to be happy like them. 
father is happy that she sent Amira to the Seventh Day Adventist School. Amira is happy that she goes to the school. It changed Amira's life. It changed father's life, and they believe it will change mother's life. They think it's the happiest school ever. Thank you for your Sabbath school mission offering today that will help spread the gospel in India and Nepal. Seven of the 10, 13 Sabbath projects involve Adventist school, like the one where Amira studies. Thank you for your generous offering. Amen. Uh, thank you very much for that beautiful item. Uh, welcome to today's lesson, Life Sentence. Um, before I start, I'm encompassed with some young people here. Um, I'd like them to introduce themselves from my extreme left. Hello, viewers. My name is Ashley Silas. Hi, my name is Salmon. Hi, my name is Sid. Hi. <coughs> Hi. My name is Peter Lewis. Thank you very much. Um, before we begin, I'd like Ashley to pray as we begin. Let us pray. Creator of the universe, we come before a throne of mercy. We are grateful and thankful that you have redeemed us. You have called us in, out of darkness into your marvelous light and that you have given us an opportunity to study your word. Lord, we pray that even as we read this word, it may be of benefit and it may bring life to our bones and healing to our souls. So these are humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this particular lesson, <clears throat> we are discussing about, in fact, the Bible calls him Good King, Jehoshaphat. And uh, we are just focusing on his story, his reign of 25 years, and what Israel actually experienced um, during his reign. Now, the other thing to note also is, 
this king also had a weakness, okay? And uh, the weakness came about by him being diplomatic. And uh, his diplomacy led him to associate with some of the kings that were not godly. And we'll also see the impact of that in his reign. Now, um, one, of, one, one, of, one of the diplomatic um, ties he made was with King Ahab, of course, and he also made um, a tie with Ahab's son, who was called Ahaziah. He also made a tie with the other son of Ahab, who was called Jehoram. And out of all the good things that this king achieved, that was one of his weak points. Now, Sid, please indulge us. What do you think makes of a good leader? What do you think is there that we can look at someone and say, or um, look at the track record and say, this is actually a good leader? Okay, so in the what do you think section, <coughs> there are, there's, there's a list of certain characteristics that we should rank from one being most crucial and six for least crucial mm -hmm. that they, the, the, we rank them according to how crucial they are for good government. Mm -hmm. um, Ashley, why don't you go first? I think the first one would be a clear sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And the reason I put that is even if the leader is not spiritual, or spiritually teaching or is endowed with wisdom, if they have a clear sense of right and wrong, they're able to distinguish between so many things. Yeah. Okay, clear sense of wrong. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Salman. Okay, I agree with Ashley on what she says, but the second one, for me, I'd go for charismatic leadership. You know, a leader needs to lead by example. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is no way a leader will lead in the wrong way and you, ex and you expect the people to follow, and, uh, to follow a charismatic way, okay? Like as Ashley said, a clear sense of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. If the leader does not do that, his people will obviously be lost, mm -hmm. yeah? Peter? Okay, I will go with Ashley. Ashley, clear sense of right and wrong. If, if a leader has the clear sense of right and wrong, he will rule the, his subjects very well. What about you, Teacher Calvin? Um, I think what Ashley has said, that a clear sense of right or wrong um, is the most astounding quality in that there are many who compromise. And, and we can even take the example of King Jehoshaphat here. Um, he wanted to form diplomatic ties with his neighbors for a good cause. He had good intentions. But as we often told, good intentions are not enough. Um, where the buck stops is to really ask yourself that is this right or wrong? And, and there's a lesson for us here. There's a lesson for, for compromise. Um, there's a theory that goes, how far is too far? And, and that, I think, for any leader, needs to be very, very clear. Very important and yeah. very clear, yeah. Okay, now what do we think is least crucial, Ashley? Least crucial would be abundance of wealth. I mean, military strength and protection is for protection of the people. Um, charismatic leadership, spiritual teaching and wisdom, civil peace and security. He cannot rule a nation that has no peace within itself and security within its borders. So I think abundance of wealth would be the least. As much as abundance of wealth comes by him being the ruler, because he's the king, because he's ruling, he has abundance of wealth. Mm. But that would be the least crucial. Yeah, I also agree. I agree with Ashley on that one. Abundance of wealth isn't really needed because all the rest are the are actually needs of the people, mm. or like civil peace and security. 
Mm. There is no way, as Ashley has said, you're going to rule a country that has no peace mm. uh, or security. <clears throat> then spiritual teaching and wisdom. You know, sometimes you hear stories of someone who's not even a Christian by any sort, but finds a bag of money and takes it to the police station. This mostly usually happens in European countries. You know, when you come to look back at it, Christianity was engraved in them generations behind. So this thing still is still flowing in them. And that's why a man who's not even a Christian can take a bag of money and take it to the police station and say, I found this. So I think uh, spiritual teaching and wisdom is valid. Yeah. Peter? Mm. I to go with that abundance of wealth, like you see the king of this kingdom, the king of Israel perhaps, No, oh. Babylon, yeah the king of Babylon, he had wealth, but God didn't approve, approved him after forcing the three Hebrew boys to kneel down. Yeah, so abundance of wealth is not that important in God's aspiration in lead leadership. Okay. Well, for myself, I think the least important <clears throat> is actually charismatic leadership. Um, and here's my interpretation of the same. Uh, because I, I feel like Charismatic leadership is someone who's familiar with many people. And I don't think that's, um, that's good because if you are truly a good leader, most of the decisions that you'll make are normally not popular with the people. Therefore, there are some leaders who will compromise on taking home the badge of being charismatic, um, stepping on some fundamental things just because um, people will go with what they've said. So sometimes as a leader, you will make uh, decisions that are not popular, and that might not earn you the badge of being charismatic. So the least, according to me, is actually being a charismatic leader. More often you will not be liked, mm -hmm. to be honest. If you're a true um, a leader who wants to choose right, you will not be liked. And I'll give you a very good example, like in our own country. If you are a very good person, uh, good standing, um, and you want to vie for any position, even an MCA seat, I mean, you have to part with some money. At least I'm aware. True. You have to part with money. You have to buy things. You have to give people money to drink alcohol and things like that. And, and, and you see, for me, uh, that already disqualifies you as, as a leader. So it will be difficult um, to, to go with all these other things save this being a charismatic leader. It's not necessary for you to be a good leader. Okay, I'm gonna throw the ball back to you, Calvin. All right, um, thank you very much, Sid, uh, for that uh, particular instance. I'd like us to read First Kings uh, 22 and verse 43, and it says, in everything he followed the ways of his father Asher and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, just before maybe Ashley takes us into the story, uh, it is important to note that Israel of old had only two categories of kings. It's either the Bible called you good or bad. We'll stop. So Ashley, tell us, how good was good King Jehoshaphat? I will go directly into the story, and it reads that after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Meunites, which are Edomites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is com coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is in En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up 
in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, The Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary in your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or the plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name, and we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Amnon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See, they are now repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession that you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For he, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but, we, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives and their children and little ones stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jahaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Matania, a Levite, a descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid, nor be discouraged, because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours. But God's. I would particularly like to underline a few points in this story. And the first part I want to say is Jehoshaphat was alarmed, but he resolved to inquire of the Lord. He was alarmed. He was scared. He had all his weaknesses and everything. He had a people to rule. He had food to provide for his people. But he resolved. He did not go to inquire of the army of um, chief in command of the army. How many men do we have? Are we able to go to to go against this vast um, army that is coming? He resolved to inquire of the Lord. He proclaimed a fast of all Judah. My my the fact the the thing I like in this point is that when he was alarmed, his first resort was God. He did not think about everything else and then come to God in the end. And the other thing is he, he identifies with God. He says, the Lord God of our ancestors, our father was your friend, Abraham your friend. He says, these people who are coming against us, you told us not to turn, not to destroy them. You would not allow us to invade when we came from Egypt. That means he knows his history very well. He... He knows what God has done for him, and therefore he trusts that because God did this for us in the past, he's able to do it now mm. and forevermore. That, that was something. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and you see, um, most times, you know, most times leaders are known to know what to do in times of crisis. But what did Jehoshaphat do? He inquired of the Lord. And in fact, if there's one word I take from this particular lesson is, the word resolve. Resolve basically means to come to the uttermost conviction that whatever you're doing is right. And, and uh, someone will ask, you know, have you ever actually really wondered what went on in the hearts of the great heroes of faith? We know there are people who've died for, for the Christian faith. Have you ever sat down to just imagine what actually went on through their minds? What do, you, what do you think? What type, of, what type of faith did they have? What resolve? What, what did they see? What promise were they given for them to have such a resolve to even die for the faith? Uh, could, you, could you repeat the question? The question is, um, there are many people who probably maybe have died for the faith. Okay? Um, what do you think makes them brave, passionate, wise, and committed to, to the cause of the faith? given the example of I guess King that's, Jehoshaphat. I guess that's a challenging question. Mm -hmm. Like, 
what 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 promise is there mm. other than the crown of life mm. and you know we are all promised the same thing yet we we do not um comprehend the magnitude mm. or the greatness of this promise and blessing so therefore many like it's this simple i like this dress mm. right the importance i attach to this dress may not be the same importance anyone else would attach to this dress it's the same as the crown of life what importance do we as a at a personal level in mm. attached to god and to the promises he gives us if we see the importance and if we fully comprehend what god has in store for us mm. then that is enough to to make us give up our lives for mm. him yeah. so i think we can conclude that for jehoshaphat at that particular point is his extreme devotion to god is what um, which led him to actually even consult him even before he actually went um into war now um i like to pose a question for peter perhaps um what is it that you think um were the controlling influences or rather in jehoshaphat's life and how can you relate that to your own life um with regards to the spirit of prophecy that what's a controlling influence that makes you tick what do you think peter okay this take take us back to the flashlight and it says if the teachings of god's word were made the controlling influence in the life of every man and woman if mind and heart were brought under its resting power Restraint. the evil the evils that now exist in nations and in social in social life would find no place mm. okay this the flashlight says that if the if the teachings of god were were made influence as in if they influence us the evil switch happens will they, will not take place because many a times we forget about the commandments and also the good works god did so they don't influence us so the evil find place in our in our midst yeah and also in day to day lives the people who my influence us like our parents if they are god keeping if they are god fearing parents they will influence us positively into doing right things and also our friends if our friends are good and if our fr- friends are god fearing people we are in- influenced positively and also as we are also if we are good people and god fearing we influence also our friends positively yes amen thank you very much for that peter now we you see we are, there are certain things that can make someone great um at least according to to what we've learned here guys i just i like to pose this question and maybe peter can start us off what are some of the three great things that a young person can acquire that when the life story is being read because I, again the title of our lesson is life sentence when when your life is over what is that thing that can be said about you that can actually be really significant peter what what are some of the things that you think okay if you are um, helping and if you are kind in the society and helping do many chores you mm. people will rem- remember you because people will always remember the good things which you do mm. and also if if you are god fearing uh, if you are god fearing people will rem- remember that this man is a god fearing mm. like mm. yeah mm. like Amen. in school if you if you are a god fearing you stand out among most of you stand out being one out of many who are who are not god fearing like in our school many students are not that god fearing but if you are if you are you are people will always remember you since you will not involved in the evil things so people will always remember the good things yeah mm, amen amen 
who else would like to go? What, what are some of the things that can actually make a young person stand out? Sid, do you want to try? Um, I think one thing is having a lot of wisdom. Because mm -hmm. not just like any wisdom, mm -hmm. like, like the right type of wisdom, being able to make the right choices mm -hmm. in, day, in your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. will definitely make people remember you. Excellent, excellent. Salmon, what are some of the things that you might think? I think for me, I'd say wisdom, because mm -hmm. you need to be wise mm -hmm. for people to remember you, because mm -hmm. that's how you make your decisions. Mm -hmm. Also, I think not being ashamed of your faith. Mm -hmm. you no, know, most young people tend to be afraid of showing their faith, mm -hmm. because their mindset is like, what will the rest think of me? Mm -hmm. It's more of peer pressure, mm. but if you're not ashamed of your faith, mm. you bring it out loud to everyone, I think you'll be, you'll have a good record of remembrance. Mm -hmm. Ashley? Well, I've been looking for a particular verse. I can't even paraphrase it because it's not coming to mind. But I would say that I read um, Proverbs 23, verse 17 and 18, which says, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous of the fear of the Lord all the day. Mm. For surely there is a hereafter and your hope will not be cut off. Mm. Um, I think that walking in the right path, however difficult, is something to be remembered for. Not, 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 let, do not let your heart fear or envy sinners. Mm. Be zealous for the fear of the Lord all day. The fear of the Lord shall cause you to be remembered ages like, look at the stories in the Bible. How many years ago did they happen? Thousands of years ago. But they're here with us day to day. Look at King Jehoshaphat. His story has been here all these years. So many kings read it after him. We are reading it after mm -hmm. them. For surely there is a here after, and your hope will not be cut off. Amen. Amen. Um, we've highlighted Jehoshaphat's devotion to God and his commandments. And under his reign, um, Israel experienced uh, many good things. And among the good things that King Jehoshaphat um, managed to take Israel through is that he actually sent out teachers to instruct the people about God. And this can be found in 2 Chronicles 17, 7 to 10. He also managed to make Israel experience wealth, and security. He also had judges organized for civil order. And the final one, which, which is like the crowning, he had a battle, battle victory, victory through won singing. through singing. You can imagine, people have assembled their weapons, they are ready to attack, then you guys start singing him 100. Great, Great is thy, is thy faithfulness. Thy faithfulness. Oh God, my father. What a weapon. And to me, this week's story highlights Jehoshaphat's leadership and his unwavering dependence on God. Mm -hmm. When you have unwavering, please note unwavering dependence on God. And unwavering means not sometimes. It's a total dependence on God. And the first step that this faithful king had, he resolved to inquire of the Lord. The Lord. Even in our circumstances, even in our difficulties, even when we think we have enough experience to go through certain things, we still need to go back to God. Because again, he could have prided himself and said, hey, I've been king for a while, so I know what to do in this manner. He still went back. He was humble enough to still go back to God and ask him, what should we actually do? Now, Salmon, what have you, in regards to this story, from the spirit of prophecy? So from the spirit of prophecy, the book is Prophets and Kings, and it's um, chapter 15. So here we see King Jehoshaphat, who's 35 and is receiving the throne from his father Asa, who was a good king. And who in nearly every crisis, mm -hmm. 
sort of the eyes of the Lord. Mm-hmm. So Je- Jehosof- Jehoshaphat is inheriting a godly kingdom, mm-hmm. but obviously the devil is there, so they are idols. But for him, he doesn't go on destroying his people. He starts by installing teachers of the law, mm. teaching his people not to do the wrong, and by protecting his people from the influence of the northern kingdom, which is King Ahab's kingdom. Mm. But we see that, as you said, he liked to have some ties. Mm. So he brought up a tie with Ahab as his son, um, Jehoam, mm. married Athaliah, daughter of Ahab. Mm. The Lord was not pleased, but it just passed on. Mm. And before the battle in the story part, mm. he, f- he had a tie with Ahab and said that he will bring up his men. Mm. But when they inquired of Micaiah, a prophet, the Lord refused. But he went on and Ab was killed. Mm. He went back to Jerusalem and the Lord told, he met Ehu, the priest, the uh, prophet who told him that the Lord told you not to go, but he went. Mm. But he repented and from that time on, he continued strengthening in his kingdom on spiritual, ma- spiritual and devotional matters, mm. not on the not on the military strength. Mm -hmm. So he strengthened his people in a way that when the Moabites and Ammonites came, Mm -hmm. they knew that they had God on their side. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Jehoshaphat was a king who learned from his mistake and from that time on, he leaned on the God toward on God towards everything. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, Sid, I'd like you to read us the key text and at least one punchline um, as we conclude. Uh, the key text comes from First Kings chapter twenty-two, verse forty-three. It says, "In everything he followed the ways of his father Asa, and did." and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed, and the people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> let me read uh, one punchline, then we can do at least one punchline each. Psalms 86 verse 2 says, Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant, who trusts in you. You are my God. Sid, you can read the next one. Uh, Psalms chapter 32, verse 10, it says, Many are the wars of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds those who trust in him. Amen. Um, Ash? I will read Job 22, verse 26 and 27. Mm-hmm. And you'll find <coughs> happiness by worshipping him. God will answer your prayers and he'll keep the promises you made to him. Mm-hmm. Peter, you can do fast, Thessalonians. For <coughs> Levitic, oh, first, first Thessalonians 4 1. First Thessalonians 4 1, and it says, as for, others, as for other matters, brother and sister, we instruct, instruct how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you. In, in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. Okay. Um, Salmon? Leviticus 10, chapter 10, verse 10 and 11. You must distinguish between what is sacred and what is common, between what is ceremonially unclean <coughs> and what is clean. And you must not, and you must teach the Israelites all the decrees that the Lord has given them through Moses. Amen. 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 Now, in our further insight section, we read here that position does not give holiness of character. It is by honoring God and obeying his commandments that a man is made truly great. Amen. And guys, I'd like to really just ask you here as we close, 
how can we be great leaders? Because again, you guys, very soon, there will be 100 positions of leadership. But from good King Jehoshaphat, how can we actually be true good leaders? We can start uh, with Peter. Leadership comes from God. So if we want to be great leaders, we should go and ask God for guidance and also to ask him for wisdom. Yeah. Amen. Sid? I'm going to have to agree with Peter. Whenever you're in a position of power and you don't know what to do, you, you, can, you can turn to God and he will he'll see you through. Amen. Amen. Salman? I'll say the most obvious, lean on the Lord in every matter. Amen. Amen. And I would say, I would read the Did You Know section, which says, The path of men who are placed as leaders is not an easy one, but they are to see in every difficulty a call to prayer. Never are they to fail of consulting the great source of all wisdom. Strengthened and enlightened by the master worker, they will be enabled to stand firm against unholy influences and to discern right from wrong, good from evil. They will prove... They will approve that which God approves and will strive earnestly against the introduction of wrong principles into his cause. Amen. 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 So in conclusion, we can say that everyone can live a life whereby they can have a positive life sentence. In that when all is said and done, what will come out from the mouths of many is a positive life sentence. It is my prayer that all the young people may resolve, as Jehoshaphat resolved, to actually depend on God, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Ashley, you can play as, pray as we conclude. Let's pray. A kind and loving Father, we are grateful and thankful for your light that you have shown upon us, that you have shown us that inquiring of the resolving to depend upon you on every single situation is that which you desire of us. You have called us to be the head and not tail. You have called us to stand as an example, to shine as the light, to be the salt of the earth. You have called us to be an example, to be a medium by which you will connect heaven and earth, by which you will show the people around us what you would love them to do. We pray, Lord, that we may follow this example of King Jehoshaphat, that even though we make many grave mistakes, we would know that you are willing to forgive us if we are faithful in repentance, and that even with our sin-mad lives, you are willing to do great things. You have also asked us to call upon you when we are in trouble. Teach us to trust and to throw our full weight on thee. For this is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.